Okay, we should be live. Um, I'm just going to check on LinkedIn to check it is popping up. But we'll just give everyone a few minutes to, to join. I was um, saying to Connor before you joined, Martin, did you do anything nice for the weekend? Kids stuff, just sort of like <laughs> keeping them keeping them busy. Uh, in Sweden, we have a sport called floorball. I was at floorball training with my son. Um, he reluctantly, he wants to go, but it was Sunday, but come Sunday morning, then he just wants to stay in bed. But then I'm already up from bed and it becomes like a, a, a challenge to get him there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, it was good. What Actually, do you do? I, oh, sorry, you got Yeah, what do you do in floorball? What is it like, football? Uh, it's like, is it, what, what's it called? Is it land hockey? It's called in, in the UK, where you're outside. Or what's it called when you... I just know it as Inibandy. Um, yes, yes, Connor, you know. Uh, unfortunately, I've been in Sweden far too long, uh, 22, <laughs> 23 years, that I, I wasn't exposed to sports like that when I grew up in England, so therefore I only no. know one word for it. But <laughs> I guess it's something like indoor floor hockey or something like, something like that. Yeah. Okay. I don't think I've ever heard of it, but we can go with that. Um, but no, lovely. So people are starting to tune in, so we will get started um so welcome everyone to another live podcast with the evolution exchange today we'll be discussing sustainability in the tech space it should be a really really fun and on heat topic i think at the moment um so i'm joined with connor and martin who are going to share their insights and everything that they are doing and they know around this topic um connor would you like to kick us off and give us a bit of an introduction yeah, so my name is Connor White. Um, I work for uh, IKEA or the retailer part of IKEA uh, called Inca. Um, I'm 52. I'm a product engineering manager. I've lived in Sweden for the last 22, three years, married with three teenagers. Um, I have a long history of being a uh, long background, being a software engineer. Um, I worked in the telecom business for 20 years uh, and now the last seven or eight years in retail uh, working for IKEA. So that's me. Perfect. And then Martin. Yes, my name is Martin Hill. I work as a product director at Motatos. Uh, as Motatos isn't very well known, I will shamelessly plug my company here. At Motatos, we challenge the thought of sustainable consumption. We want everyone to be able to contribute to saving our planet in an effortless way. And we believe revolutionizing how we always view food waste is a good place to start. So what we do is we basically sit between the, the uh, companies selling food to, to FMCG or to the like ICA in Sweden and, and uh, Marks and Spe no, yeah, uh, Marks and Spencer's or Sainsbury's in the UK, and the stuff that is not acceptable in terms of amount of days left, um, we sell and we sell it online to, to customers, making sure that affordable and sustainability isn't mutually exclusive. Today we're present in Sweden, Finland, Denmark, UK, and Germany. And my role is that I lead the, the product managers in our product organization. Currently, four product teams working with different, solving different customer and user problems at, at the company. So, uh, really exciting. Amazing. Um, lovely. Well, it should be a really great podcast. You guys have such interesting backgrounds that I'm very excited to see what see what thoughts we come up with. Um, but let's dive right in. So how we will do this is how we normally do it. So we've pre-prepared some questions and some subtopics to discuss a little bit more in detail. Um, Connor, would you like to kick us off and introduce yours? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the question uh, that I've set is what our... What are our sustainability challenges? Uh, how are we addressing them from a digital IT perspective? And what are the opportunities thereafter or therein? Um, I guess, uh, Gemma, am, am I going to start off with answering that question myself first? Or? Go for it. Yeah, go for it. Um, so when it comes to sustainability challenges, um, the big one is uh, being able to measure um, our sustainability uh, footprint, and I'm uh, more folk. Uh, I work in an area uh, which I forgot to say, uh, which is focusing on our uh, real estate uh, and digitizing our real estate processes and our expansion processes. So I'm very much involved in 
uh, you know, the footprint, the carbon footprint of what it costs to run our business in terms of energy, water and waste and food waste is actually a part of that, actually, Martin. Um, so the challenge we have, of course, uh, is that as sustainability and uh, climate positive starts to get uh, more regulated uh, and expectations on companies are to, to be more uh, transparent. It's really important that we're able to measure reliably uh, and then we're not just you know, putting a finger up in the air and uh, sampling and, and, and so on, because we could all get, we could easily get accused of green, greenwashing, for example. Um, so the big challenge actually is on the measurement side of it. And then just measuring it isn't going to help us achieve those 2030, 2050 goals. Um, of being, you know, of getting to carbon zero by 2050. Um, it's also about helping us when we have better transparency, um, being able to see where we can lower it and where we can tune, where we can optimize. Um, we also have to uh, invest in changing our business. So we have to start measuring. We have to put electricity meters into our, into our, into our, into our stores, into our warehouses, etc. And we have to gather the data from that. Uh, once we have that data, we then use integrate it with the systems that we use for reporting, for business intelligence, and, and, and stuff like that. But that also allows us to to, to, to see, uh, you know, compared to the amount of investments we're making into renewable energy, putting solar panels on the roofs, how much are we uh, how much are we consuming versus how much are we producing? And that helps us also start to uh, publish information on. Yeah, are we getting to carbon neutral? Yeah, so the challenge is the measurement. Uh, the challenge is to have trust in the data. The challenge is to automate the data collection, uh, but make sure the data is consistent. So it's not just about data quality. So it's, it's about data quality, making sure that uh, what we produce in our reports, um, it, it, there's a lineage of that data and that we can trust where it came from and also how it's calculated. That, we, that we're using some master data, some some uh, calculation data to enable us to calculate it correctly. So we need to collaborate with uh, with with, uh, with players. Uh, we need to source uh, calculation data. We need to source tools um, uh, that are trusted uh, from an ESG uh, perspective, so that our reports uh, can stand up uh, to, to to being challenged as they should be. Um, how are we addressing it uh, from a digital IT perspective? Yeah, I think I've touched on it. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we have uh, we can trust the data. We also need to make sure that um, we do it in a timely fashion. And that means that we avoid bottlenecks. Um, that means we need to have a technology and a data architecture that enables and empowers everybody to contribute to collecting that data. Uh, but also having a somewhat aiming for a somewhat distributed architecture um, we also have to make sure that no matter how, uh, where the data is coming from, that it's consistent uh, when it's consumed for business reporting, business intelligence, and things like that. And that's not always easy because if you enable data to be consumed by the many, if you take it at the wrong time, it could be seen as uh, inconsistent, uh, even if the data is actually sound. So we need to agree rules on when is the data sort of baselined and changed and that all report uh, consumers of that data uh, are taking the same consistent view of the data. So yeah, we're trying to do things in a, in a decentralized way. Uh, it would be easier to do it centralized, but then you hide the complexity of getting the data. So we're trying to be more transparent about how we collect the data, empower the many different parts of our business to be able to, 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 get, to get that information. What are the opportunities? Um, the big opportunity is when you start measuring, you start to see um, the opportunity to, well, what if I put this information in the hands of uh, the many co-workers across our business? What if I put that in the hands of a, of a, of a co-worker working in the IKEA restaurant or in the IKEA kitchen? And they could see their uh, carbon footprint 24-7, uh, uh, changing for 50, every 15 minutes or every 10 minutes. Would that change behavior? Would they maybe... Uh, uh, delay putting the dishwasher on until after 7 p.m. and avoid paying a higher price for carbon uh, during those peak, peak times when, uh, when there's more carbon-based electricity into the grid. So that we're, we're starting to experiment and, uh, and, and hypothesize on uh, exposing the data to in a much easier format for the many co-workers as a way of potentially changing behavior and also uh, maximizing the, the consumption of electricity or maximizing the, um, the, the not the, the value of the electricity we're consuming, I should say. 
Um, sometimes here we put the ovens on in the morning when we come to work, but we don't need to put them on immediately, but we can put them on half an hour before the store opens, for example. And thus, the opportunity there is not just empowering the co-workers, but enable them to make better decisions so that ultimately we lower the carbon footprint and potentially lower our energy spend, uh, which actually improves the bottom line. So there's an opportunity there. Um, and then furthermore, once you start to measure your entire business, you start to see the opportunity of becoming more proactive in the management of your properties. Um, I have this uh, personal sort of uh, dream that, you know, what would smart buildings look like? You know, if we were able to measure the energy footprint of our high wattage devices, like a, a heating ventilation AC unit, we could potentially uh, measure it against its, uh, its approved range. And when it goes out of range, maybe we could poll it using its API and see if there are any warnings that can need or errors that need to be acted upon. And if there's a component failing, maybe we could pre-approve uh, pre the replacement of a component and maybe uh, order it. Uh, at the same time and then maybe the first time the fm or the facility management people get involved is when they have to install this new component they knew nothing about and uh, it helps extend the life of our assets or, or, or these equipments and, and and ultimately lowers the running cost of our business so i have some really hopeful ambitions here they may take five years they may take 10 years to get there but i think uh, there's definitely solutions uh, in what we're building and what our partners and uh, and what the wider ecosystem is building that will enable us to 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 lower the carbon footprint but also help us run our businesses at a lower cost those are the kind of the options. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you and get what do you think about all that martin <laughs> Yeah, Connor is getting me so excited. I want to join this journey. I think uh, I definitely <laughs> think uh, digitalization and having data on our on the value chain and everything that happens within the company's sphere of operations is is what can empower us to make better decisions going forward. Uh, how? Just a couple of questions popped up when you were were answering Connor. How how happy are your your partners to share their data on on, on their carbon footprint? Has that been that a challenge? Yeah, I, I would say the, the, the bigger challenge or, or, the, or the prerequisite challenge is, is getting our own data out from, for example, uh, SaaS solutions, you know, software as a service, because um, we need access to our own data. We need the APIs um, and a bit frustrating when, you know, some of the decisions we made in the past um, were not necessarily the decisions we would make now in terms of which partners to, to partner with because now we're a little bit more savvy around we want access to api we want to buy solutions that have apis so we can get access to our data um that said i, I had an interesting uh, uh dialogue with one of our partners where um I, I i suggested to them that perhaps they could encourage better utilization of their infrastructure um by actually sharing with the users um the carbon footprint of what they're doing um, because we're doing that internally, you know, we're starting to to make it. Uh, well, not starting. We have made it uh, as part of our default cloud infrastructure reporting, not just the cost of the cloud infrastructure, but actually the, the carbon footprints of that cloud infrastructure. And and you won't be surprised to hear that it's, there's a there's a somewhat of a correlation there. The more you consume, the higher carbon footprint. Uh, you'll never guess. But it's actually starting to stimulate uh, an interesting uh, focus that, oh, you know, if, if you maybe weren't so cost conscious, shall we say, which is one of our core values, you might be more carbon conscious or carbon footprint conscious, and it might trigger a change in behavior. Maybe we should uh, you know, go to more serverless infrastructure instead of being happy with a virtual machine type solution. So, yeah, we it, it, it's an interesting question. I, I won't say I've done it with all our, all our, all our vendors, but I am starting to ask that question. Um, and it's, it's, it's triggering an, in, an interesting response, something that our vendors haven't even thought about. And fr from what I understood of, of, of the solution was the gathering and making data available of the carbon footprint of the operations, but mainly aimed at internal users in terms of employees and store operations. But you also mentioned that it could be made available to, to like end consumers in the end. Was, is that correct? Yeah, so the, the way we're looking at it um, is we need to provide, we need to enable uh, uh, an architecture, data architecture, let's say, um, that enables us to uh, compile um, enterprise level sustainability reporting to be compliant with some of the, you know, the, the, the regulatory and uh, 
uh, reporting that's needed, but also to follow, to support our leadership that are making a strong stand here. Uh, Jesper Bredien you know, was recently, our CEO was recently in Davos, uh, talking about the need for a sustainability transformation and and and, the, um, and highlighting the urgency here. Uh, so we we need to be able to you know, be consistent in and uh, and be able to defend the data that we're we're presenting in our reporting. Um, but at the same time, we don't want it to be a bottleneck. So we do need to enable that data to be consumed by the many internally so that they can start making their own uh, improvements and act take their own actions uh, on their specific part of the business, whether it's on the, the fulfillment side of things, whether it's in the, you know, the store operations um, or whether it's in you know, co-worker travel for that matter. Um, that, we're, that They're able to take their own insights and act on it and follow up and track and things like that. Have you had any pushback? Anyone who's not been too keen on it or any like resilience? I would say that the not necessarily pushback. And the reason for that is um, this was a bit of a shock to me when joining IKEA about seven or eight years ago. You know, I came from a company, Ericsson, where we had three, uh, three words for our core values. I think I still remember them, pers perseverance, professionalism and respect to a company that has like eight, uh, eight statements. Uh, of core values, and it took me a few years to really get on top of them. But one of them um, is very front and center here, which is caring for people and planet. And, and therefore, when you bring up the, you know, the carbon footprint, the sustainability question in some of the different discussions, it, it, you, you don't get resistance to it. More, uh, I hadn't thought of that, if you see what I mean. And that's a very good point. Maybe we should think about that in the way we evolve our business model or come up with a new business uh, a business model or a business opportunity and things like that uh, especially when you know coming up with delivering new services and not just new products so yeah it's more oh wow thanks for that that's a really good idea hmm? i mean i love the idea when you told it to me i remember being so excited i think I came back to the office and i was like oh my word they're doing this i think it's a great thing um definitely leading from the front in sweden um martin um Anything you want to add to this? I think that it was a great and really interesting answer from Connor. And I think uh, I'll start answering it. And then I think um, the, the answer kind of ties into what will be my question. But I, I think the, I mean, now at Motetos, we don't really have to prioritize between or, or challenge between like like our core business challenge versus sustainability challenge because the core of what we're do, doing is making the, the food industry more efficient and selling what wouldn't have been sold otherwise but I have not only worked here I've only been here for two months I have worked at a, a large fashion retailer prior prior to this and there it's a bigger question of like sustainability versus um, revenue i guess and, and uh, how to to address them and and there i think even when, when getting down down to, to the issues when we have possible ways of, of decreasing carbon footprint or, or decreasing improving sustainability outcome with digital solutions it's always weighing up between revenue impact versus sustainability impact and and how to how to compare those two in in um uh, transparent way. Hmm. Uh, Just uh, speaking, following up on that, I mean, one of the things that um, has inspired me uh, in, in in the recent years is uh, yeah, the, the the leadership at the top of the company that, that talks about you know, doing good business is good business. Uh, in other words, um, by investing heavily in sustainability. It has the side effect, a potential of lowering our, you know, our overall cost. Um, um, is that something that you've seen uh, in terms of uh, some, the way you, the, the business processes, the, the sourcing of materials, the transport of materials, um, even things like, you know, co-worker travel that now that we've had the pandemic and we've seen such a dramatic improve, improvement in the quality of uh, virtual collaboration that, that yeah, there are cost savings to be made, and therefore, it can then create that snowball effect of you know enabling you to invest in more in more products that are more sustainable. That then make it you know. Are you seeing anything like that in your? Definitely, area? definitely, and and then maybe more at previous uh, previous employers, but but looking at how consumers are becoming more aware of the impact on the environment of their consumption. I think being able to offer a more sustainable alternative 
really helps the business. Then I think, I mean, both both Motetos and, and other other companies as well really need to empower the consumers or, or the end users of the products to to understand the impact of the the. the consumption choices they make and even though at, at Motetos I think we're doing a lot of good I, I really look forward to being able to give even more carbon footprint data to customers to, to enable them to make even better choices not only by our, our affordable food but also w- what makes the biggest change for, for the environment uh, and that I think goes for all companies I think consumers want to know they want to be able to make smart choices but I don't think we're, we're yeah going back to what you were, were saying earlier Connor I don't think we're giving them enough data to make those choices yeah Amazing. That's, that's fair uh, anything to add in response to that Connor I, I, I think the, the the question about uh, you know sharing information, um, it, it it's uh, it's about changing a, a mindset, right? Um, if you don't if you don't have full confidence in the data you have internally, the last thing you're going to be doing is sharing it externally, right? Um, but at the same time, if you don't start sharing that data, you won't get feedback on on the data and the quality of the data. So it's kind of a vicious circle. Um, I think we do need to get better at, uh, the, you know, across industries, we need to get better at, uh, at sharing the data we have um, and then getting feedback on it and acknowledging, yes, if, if we've got something wrong and fixing it, right? Uh, we're all human. Um, companies you know, make mistakes. Um, but if we do it with the right mindset, we do it with a humble attitude, you know, humbleness and, and willingness, to, and willingness to, to take action on it, um, then we can get it right. Um, but if you don't share anything, you're not going to get any feedback and you're just going to create suspicion, uh, which is the last place you want to be. Um, so I think it's a journey. Um, there are risks, of course, uh, being you know in t- transparent. We, we do need to do our best to uh, qualify the data um, so that we have you know, some trust in, in the data. Um, and we need, we need to, for example, if I take the example of uh, me- how we measure... Um, uh, co- customer mobility to our stores, you know, is sampling a thousand people uh, per year in a country a good enough uh, data set to say, you know, what the carbon footprint of our customers traveling to the store? No. Um, but then we need to find something else better, right? Um, we need to invest and do something better. Uh, so, you know, it's... Uh, I, I, I verge personally on the I, I, on the I, on on the side of uh, increasing transparency, but doing it with a humble spirit that we you know that we will get it wrong sometimes, and uh, and we will get get a, get a feedback, and we will you know have to, to acknowledge that feedback and do better. Just on that, um, our curiosity, both of you have well, you're both working at companies that are quite international. You have branches everywhere. Um, well, if we just when you're looking at like the carbon footprint of going to a store or picking up groceries or them being delivered, does that change country to country or is it is the data quite sufficient? Would you take the data from every country? I guess it's the, the question I'm trying to ask. Yeah, I mean, the intention with a, glo- with a global company, you have to gather, you know, representative data from all of your um, regions, markets uh, and stores. Otherwise, yeah, you're, you're going to be quite, you're going to be fast going down that route of being accused of greenwashing, right? That the sample is too small and it's not representative and it's not global, et cetera. So, yes, uh, we're going to have to do that, which is why we're going to need global solutions for it. Um, you know, ha- having uh, manual surveys in you know thirty plus countries is 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 not going to hack it. Um, we need to at the same time um, we don't want to be tracking our customers unnecessarily, right? So there's a data privacy aspect to this. So we need to use tools and technologies that um, that are, are ideally a anonymous as source. You know, geospatial data, you know, that, you know, that kind of stuff. The stuff that you can get from like mobile network vendors on you know uh, that's completely anonymized as source, for example. How about for yourself, Martin? I think that the two things uh, Connor brings up are, are such interesting examples, both with the data collection privacy versus being able to do good with the data, and then also the part of, of greenwashing. I think there are a lot of companies trying to do good things within the sphere of, of increasing the sustainability of what the company is offering, 
but at the same time as being kind of first movers in that space, they risk being uh, accused of greenwashing because there is no there is no like industry standard. There there is no global guidelines. Every company is doing what works for them and feels like it makes sense. And, but then they also risk being accused of, of greenwashing while they're actually trying to do good. And I don't know the solution to this, but, but I don't want the companies that, that are trying to make a difference to be punished for being first movers. Mm. But it is, it is a risk. I mean, if you're a first mover, you could be accused of, uh, you know, jumping on the on the on the kind of bandwagon. Right. And, and using it as a marketing exercise. Right. Um, and, and there's a lot of skepticism. Right. You know, that it's just a PR exercise. Uh, so we do need to move quickly to back up you know, our ambitions, um, and we do need yeah you know, we need we need to set an example. I mean, and that's also something that's also important as well that, that we lead by example, um, not just in, in, internally but also you know externally, uh, and that's something that you know IKEA traditionally hasn't always done that. You know, we've we've been a very sort of private, humble company, but in the last few years, uh, our leadership have taken a stand that. Because the climate um, uh, and, the, and, and the, the global warming and, and the impact of climate is so existential for for the globe, for the for, 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 for the whole planet, that we can't afford to be, you know, um, you know, proud internally. We have to we have to start sort of setting an example there out there as well, and encourage the wider industry to 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 to, 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 to work with us on this. Um, which is one of the reasons why I actually, you know, attending this because uh, I don't think, uh, you know, we should be holding back our, you know, any secrets on, you know, on our strategies and what we're trying to do here uh, and learn from others and share what we know so that we can move forward faster. That's really important. Perfect. I think that's a really great point to end on, if that's all right with yourself. Um, and then we could say, Martin, do you want to introduce your question? Yes, absolutely. I feel like we've touched on it a bit, but let's let's dive dive in a bit more. Yes. Uh, and I mean, th there are a lot of companies try trying to do well and trying to have an impact on sustainability. Uh, my question is, how can one prioritize and evaluate among initiatives that impact sustainability versus other closer to core KPIs such as revenue or profit? Um, I think you, you touched upon it, Connor, but, but how can we like doing good for do doing things that impact our sustainability is good for the environment and then also if if we can track it towards impact of the, the more core business kpis that that's good but that won't always be the case i mean i've i've had previous situations in in my career where i have we can do this which decreases our, our climate impact by 20 percent and then we have this other thing we can do, which will, or, or maybe let's take that initiative. It, it decreases our climate impact by, by 20%. It also has a risk of, of decreasing our revenue by 2%. How do I know, how can I translate 20% sustainability into 2% revenue? And how can we make sure that, how, how can we make sure that when, when push comes to shove or when we get down to it, that we actually uh, put, I guess, yeah, I, I, I want to find a way to put a monetary value and maybe across the industry, but, but what, what is what is the cost of our carbon carbon footprint and, and how can we take accountability and also set monetary metrics on, on, on our, our carbon footprint? And I don't have an as good answer to this question. This is I, I would love to hear your thoughts on it, Connor. I, I think uh, this is a challenge I've had, but I don't have a solution to it. I, I, I share the I share the challenge, um, and, and especially now. Um, you know, a year ago, even uh, or even a year and a half ago, even when we were coming out in the pandemic, um, we weren't really seeing the the cost increase on our, you know, in terms of our raw materials and products uh, feeding through into, you know, what we now see is the cost of living crisis where prices have gone up. Right. Um, and uh, at least in our business, you know, we're a business that's very much focused on, you know, the, the, uh, the many people, right. And the, especially the people with the, uh, the thin wallets. So, you know, if we, if we start raising prices, which we have done, um that that breaks the cycle of of how of our business model which is you know 
we, we have low prices, which leads into uh, higher volumes, which leads into profits, which allows us to invest, you know, that, that whole sort of cyclical, uh, you know, enhancing effect. When you start sort of raising prices, um, that you're breaking that cycle. So we, there, right now, um, sustainability is maybe not necessarily uh, get, top of the mind. It's still there, but it's not top of the mind because of the focus on profit, profitability, but also on lowering cost. Um, I would argue that a lot of the sustainability investments have uh, the potential to lower cost. So I think the, the, the challenge is prioritizing those sustainability initiatives that have the stronger business case. So, for example, in, in, in my case, it would be, you know, the, the existing investment we're doing in integrating our the data from our electricity meters across the globe, um, putting that information in the hands of the many co-workers, for example, um, could ha has the potential to, to lower our energy spend, which, you know, actually lowers cost, uh, but as well as contribute to our carbon footprint and make it easier and more trustworthy to capture the data and put it into our into our sustainability reporting, which is the primary business case. So I think in times like now where profitability is, is a challenge and we need to get control of costs and, and not just through sustainability investments, I think the key thing there from a governance perspective is, is to prioritize those business cases um, where the sustainability also has a, 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 a B effect uh, a side effect, sorry, uh, now, now I'm getting my Swedish and English confused. Um, a side effect of, of actually contributing to significantly, uh, making a contribution to the lower cost. Um, but I, 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 but I, but that's not always the case. I mean, you mentioned there about products that maybe, you know, um, are more expensive uh, you know, uh, uh, the, or services because it's a uh, sustainable choice, right? Um, there, I think we... It, it, I don't know what the answer to that is, to be honest. Uh, we just need to work harder. I, I fundamentally believe that if you just keep working harder at it, you will find those optimizations, those supply chain optimizations, those uh, material choices, um, those manufacturing techniques that can get that cost down for that su sustainable product. So it's a question of focus. So if it's not profitable enough, then it needs more work, period. But you need to focus on those products that are sustainable um, because that's where the, the, the long-term gains uh, can be made, both for the planet and also from getting the, prop the costs down so we can sell those, uh, sell those products and services uh, at the price that, you, that your, your customers are willing to pay. I think does that, does that help, uh, Martin? Yes, it, it does help. Thank you, Connor. I think you've just touched on it, Connor, but Dean's asked a question, I don't know if you can both see it at the screen, of yes. how do you measure the cost of your carbon footprint currently? I, maybe I, I can take that yeah. one and share Go some on, examples, uh, both from, from uh, at Motetos and, and previous employers. I, I think... I think there are different ways of doing this. Right now, we don't produce any goods ourselves. We uh, sell from others, and so we need to rely on getting good data from them. And where I've been previously, we, we measure it ourselves. I think the challenge which we've been discussing is how, how do we measure the, the cost of it? Like, what, what is the cost? Right now, what, what I'm looking into and, and thinking about is whether should we let, should we prioritize selling something with a high carbon footprint uh, at a cheaper price with Montetos to make sure that it reaches the customer and, and we, we get it out there as the carbon footprint has al already been created. Where I've been at previous employers, I think a good example there has been to make the carbon footprint part of the cost of goods sold. So when planning to, to make new products that that it's seen as a cost already in, in the, not only as a monetary cost, but actually it impacts the cost of goods sold. So something with a high carbon footprint is seen as a costly good. Then I can't say what, what, the, what, what the translation we did between carbon, carbon footprint and money, but, but there I think it was a good example of where it becomes a natural part of the business and not something on the side. Mm. Um, so the, I, those are two I, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you, we we are going to need to show um, you know the the carbon dioxide you know uh, amount you know on the product and services uh, that we that we sell because we're starting to you know, uh, you know have it thrown at us for the infrastructure we're consuming the digital infrastructure. Um, but I think there's also another strategic um, aspect to that. 
and that is um, you know the the influence of the warming planet on uh, the inflation on raw materials on you know energy. Uh, of course, you know energy is being heavily influenced by you know the war in the war in Europe, of course. Um, but it's also being influenced by um, more macro, you know, uh, effects like, you know, lower river levels, lower lake levels, lower rainfall in places that we used to have a lot of rainfall, which is impacting, you know, things like hydroelectric uh, uh, power, for example. So I, I, I suspect, and you know, this is just a, uh, I don't have the, the facts to make it up, but I, I suspect that, that, you know, what we're seeing in, you know, inflation is a, a significant part of that is, is the fact that, the carbon cost, if we say, it, is starting to be priced in now because it's getting more expensive to to manufacture. It's getting more expensive to 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 to, to sell services and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, Dean, I don't know if that's uh, the combined uh, answer from both of us uh, helped helped with that. Um, Perfect. I think I think it did sounded really good. Um, I've learned something new. I hadn't thought about like the the environment actually making that cost yeah i don't know why i hadn't thought that it makes perfect sense um well, I think I think, about, for example the hoover dam potentially might be shutting down because uh, the lake levels are too low uh, and that gives you a classic uh, yeah um you know issue where the cost of electricity in the you know the western part of the united states might might start to rocket quite high because they won't be able to getting that they won't be getting that cheap hydroelectric that they used to rely on um, and I think this question's more to you, Connor. Um, I won't yeah. even try and pronounce that in, in a Swedish name. Um, so Mundal, uh, Ikea Mundal. I think that's uh, Gothenburg, if I'm not mistaken, if my Swedish geography is correct. Um, how, regarding being automated, how will it affect sustainability in the run? Um, that's a good question, and I'm not entirely sure what you mean by automation here. If we mean um, the sort of logistics, the back-end logistics side of things, um, or if it's the automated uh, facility management, you know, the monitoring, the measurement of our of our other sensors, taking all the data and then using that data and some algorithms and some machine learning to to, to take decisions on, you know, how we how we operate our stores. I'm not entirely sure what uh, kind of automation is meant here. Um, I'll hazard a guess. It's more of the the store operations on the, on the on on how how stock is moved around the store uh, and things like that. Um, I mean that uh, yeah. If we're automating stuff and it used to be done done by people, um, then you're consuming power, right? Um, but I think that's more a case of uh, you know, some of the business cases for our back-end automation, our fulfillment automation is driven by lowering cost, right? So it means our co-workers can do something uh, you know, more constructive in terms of uh, meeting our customers and, and helping them in buying decisions and things like that. So in that respect, I think the automation, if I'm, if I'm assuming the automation is more in you know, how we, in our logistics side of things, it just helps us become more effective and have a lower and if, uh, reuse our coworker capacity to be to be more uh, you know enrich the customer experience. I would I would argue and therefore lower our long term cost, um, but not necessarily a direct uh, sustainability direct uh, input. If that's the automation that's uh, um, that's been mentioned, hope that answers the question. Um, I'm sure it does. Um, yeah. Is there anything that Mark Smart do? Um, Martin, that's a bit different. In terms of logistics operations, we actually have a really cool warehouse in Örebro. I uh, have no illusion of it being uh, grander than what IKEA have, but but we are looking into automation and how it can improve improve the efficiency of of what we do. Um, and the, yeah, automation will will play a part for for. Um, make it make it decreasing our carbon footprint making sure that we can do things as efficiently as possible i actually will add something to the the logistic automation because that implies of course that we're doing digital it solutions um and i actually had the conversation with somebody the other uh, in the uh, last couple of days regarding you know how 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 sustainable how effective are we you know when we build these digital solutions you know when when we put when we throw loads of uh, compute and and IT solutions into the cloud are are we really being sustainable ourselves 
And I think that's a re really good question to ask ourselves. Um, I saw an article, I think, on the BBC over the weekend about some technology capabilities that is able to identify uh, patterns of data uh, on, on the cloud. Um, and uh, because you know, if, you, if you duplicate loads of data in the cloud, you're, 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 you're wasting resources, right? You, you, want the same, you want the data to be reused, right? And, uh, and I think technology like that, enabling us to work uh, or deliver a more effective, sustainable IT solution, I think is gonna be really, really interesting um, going forward in the future. Of course, you know, we have to pay for it, um, but I'm pretty sure that there's probably a business case that uh, more than offsets any investment in that kind of technology capability. This is such an exciting topic. I actually was reading an article just earlier today shared from a, a colleague here at M Motetos around that with with um, what 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 the cloud what what impact the cloud is having on us. And I mean the 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 selling arguments you hear that ah, it makes us more efficient. We're not reliant on on uh, on hardware. But I mean my my journey be working tightly with people working with with uh, both on site uh, or on on premise hardware and and working with with uh, cloud solutions is that we've gone from a history where we really maximize the use of our on prem servers how we store data and how we compute the data and then moving into cloud and i always thought ah but it's more efficient and it is but also we're working with cloud providers that i mean they want us to, to use as much cloud resources as possible so it like is what is the net effect of moving into the cloud in terms of uh, sustainability and and uh, and impact uh, probably uh, probably positive but it's just a, an aspect of it that i haven't really been thinking about before in terms of what are the uh, yeah what does what do the cloud provider providers want their customers to do yeah, I think that's a. I mean, it, it, it's um, we, we've been investing heavily in the last few years in, in going moving from as you, you know um, fully on prem to you know uh, a better mix between uh, on prem and, and cloud, um, and we, we've seen the you know the, the easy move you know the replace the virtual machine or the physical machine with a virtual machine in cloud, but that doesn't necessarily save you much money, right? Um, you're still paying for something whether you use it or not, right? Um, the, yeah. What we see uh, pushing for now is moving ag aggressively moving our uh, our cloud uh, uh, infrastructure usage to be more serverless, um, which is gives super opportunities. You know, you pay you pay for what you use, um, but it also means that it comes with a lower carbon footprint, and we're starting to see that because uh, we're starting to see in our uh, internal reporting and cost of that allocation, the cost reporting on our cloud infrastructure, we're now starting to see the the, the carbon footprint of, of that. Um, but I think there's a, an awful lot more there. I think the, we're going to be using a lot more cloud infrastructure going forward. So we still will need to keep abreast of, you know, uh, emerging cloud infrastructure uh, that, that can, like I mentioned before, like uh, and uh, can avoid, you know, data being duplicated all over the all over the place. Um, and then and that comes with its own, you know, with its own challenges. Uh, I think there's a uh, there's a lot to be said both for security, but also and even things like GDPR uh, that we shouldn't necessarily be sort of duplicating uh, data all over the place. Maybe we should be doing more pass by reference or, or maybe even think technologies like blockchain could come along where, you know, you, you're, you're, you, only, you, you only access the data you need um, and things like that. So I think there's, there's a lot of innovation in, in this space that we can take advantage of over the next five to 10 years. Um, yeah, I think we've got another question, or We've got another question. Um, Dean has asked, how are you controlling these IT resources and infrastructure? Martin, do you want to start? I mean, right now at, at uh, Motetos, we, we aren't that big. That, that This is not a, a big worry. But, but I think going back to what we've said earlier, I think, I think they, data is the key. Um, we, we need to know what we're... What, what we're consuming, what we plan to consume, and, and, and what the cost and, and impact of that consumption is. I have some worst case examples of where we didn't set limits on the cost of calling an API and we, we let it run for the weekend and then we came back Monday and it cost us a million sec, which the, the total cost of the the pro, or the co total cost of the budget for the project was like a, a hundred thousand sec and, and uh, yeah. 
we, we burned through it for a weekend. So I think definitely control mechanisms and, and the governance of, of our cost is, is uh, very, very important. Yeah, I, um, now you're being open and uh, open and honest there, Martin. And uh, yeah, we I've had my fair share of uh, of, uh, of uh, nightmare days where we've seen you know cost rocket in a few hours. Um, and uh, you know, I've made it a habit of mine to you know every day, if not every other day, you know, go into the cloud reporting tools and just check. You know, nothing is going funny. Um, yeah, it, it's still it does feel still a little a little bit like the wild west uh, sometimes. You know, get new tools, new toys, uh, and give it to our engineers, and you know they're they're playing with them, and then suddenly all hell breaks loose and the costs go to hell. Sorry, bad language. Um, hope that. Um, that one's that one's um, all right. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, but I think that you're, that there's more to it than just sort of keeping an eye on a day by day basis. It's also, um, the, the more strategic governance of this, you know, where, where it's quite good to have architects, you know, keeping the, 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 the digital teams honest, uh, challenging them and saying, okay, why are you using that infrastructure? Um, and giving them feedback and giving them guidance on, you know, what other infrastructure they could use that's more, more cost conscious or more sustainable. Um, I think being having the ability to uh, you know have reporting on the infrastructure on a company level, uh, not necessarily available for everybody, but you know available to the to the CTO level and the architecture community. Um, I think those kind of things help, um, but I also think that uh, you can't uh, uh, take away the accountability of the individual team for their own infrastructure spend, and that they need to know what they're spending, and it needs to be fully transparent. And that also means that. You have to think a bit DevOps like that. You know, if there's uh, if there's a uh, if there's spend going up quickly, that that feeds back into you know Slack and uh, uh, warnings and alerts start happening uh, to the team, and they're like, oh, what have we done? You know. Um, similarly, you've got you've deployed some infrastructure on an environment that you don't need to be running twenty four seven, and it's been the testing was done yesterday. Why is it still up and running? You know, having an alert mechanism and giving the feedback loop to the developer team um, that, that they, they do you still need this environment? Why why is it still running? Why is it still consuming? You know that kind of feedback loop and that can be automated. Um, yeah, we've got another question. We're very popular. Um, so after working with sustainability at your com current company, would it be a requirement to continue working with sustainability when looking for future roles? I can start. Uh, no yes, it would. I, and not only roles, I think. I mean, I, I, I swapped. I was shopping around for jobs during the, during the autumn of, of uh, 2022. And I think, yeah, I mean, now my kids are, are uh, growing up. They're old enough to understand what I, I do for a living. And I think where we are right now in the world, it's important for me to work at a place where I feel I have a Im positive impact on, 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 on the world around me, whatever the, the greatness of it. But, but I definitely feel like I want to work somewhere where I can be proud of, of the, the end product of, of what I'm doing is. Yeah, I'll try and attempt. Thanks for jumping in there, Martin. I wasn't sure I fully understood the question. <laughs> you bought me a bit of time. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of feel that right now, um, I'm in a kind of dream job scenario. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working to make the world a better place and I'm doing that by, uh, digitizing, you know, our business processes when it comes to you know, operating our, our, our physical infrastructure, you know, stores, um, um, warehouses, etc. Um, and I couldn't, you know, that there's so much work there to be done you know if 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 if, if I, I just mentioned go back to that uh, statement about you know what would what would amazing look like you know that would mean that we have a feedback loop that automates the whole decision making process for for for, for maintaining and ext and optimizing our, our properties right that's maybe 5 10 years away um Ultimately, I think uh, you're right. Uh, sustain and also sustainability isn't just about carbon footprints. It's also about, you know, uh, looking after people as well. Um, and I think there's uh, there's so much that can be done from the sort of the customer, the, the individual um, uh, contributor uh, in, in, in the company and also kind of customers outside. You know, how, how do we make engaging with them sustainable? Uh, and I think there's a huge uh, op uh, amount of work to be done to look at you know, how to work with um, 
customer data and stuff like that. Um, you know, what, what, why do why is it that every company uh, a customer engages with has a copy of the customer's data? And uh, do we honestly think it's going to be uh, complete and correct when it's uh, you know there's a thousand copies of it over the world? Um, I think there's a um, I, I think there's so much work, there's so much, uh, prob so many problems to solve uh, with innovative solutions that uh, I, as long as I'm working for a company that is very values driven and takes these challenges seriously, I, you know, um, I would, I would uh, be, stay I would, I would want to stay in this kind of uh, uh, space. That's my answer. Perfect. And I'm going to spin this into my question of, so that's you move into a different company, but how does your company's sustainability plans at the moment affect when you're recruiting? So do you look more for people who are more remote and can work from home or how they travel into the office or does it not affect the process whatsoever? So Martin, maybe I'll just jump in this one because this is actually a, a, a big topic uh, or, or not a big topic, but um uh, important uh, topic for for us uh, within IKEA. I mentioned before that we're a very values-driven company, uh, and uh, you know, one of the eight values we have, the the one that's often the foundation of all of them, is togetherness. Um, uh, you know, you don't solve problems unless you work together, right? Um, we all know the value of. Uh, meeting up with a colleague you haven't sort of bumped into for a while at the coffee machine and oh that reminds me you know and then and then solving an issue or getting some clarification on a problem right um we at ikea really fundamentally believe that the best way to work together is by meeting face to face right uh now what of course that's um had to take into account that you know we've learned how to collaborate quite effectively uh, uh since the pandemic right uh, so whilst uh, uh, you know, we can work effectively on the pandemic, um, I, I personally have seen a lot more value uh, uh, in occasionally you know, meeting my co-workers uh, face to face in, 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 in the office. Um, it's a lot more relaxed. Um, you can be more yourself. Uh, you're not time constrained by the start and end of, of a meeting. I mean, we all know the drill here. It's much more relaxed, much more flexible when you can be, meet people face to face. So, so when it comes to the, you know, we as a company uh, and how we approach it, uh, we, everybody, every coworker has their location base and their physical site. Um, we do encourage people to, to work together with their colleagues. Uh, we put, uh, we try as much as possible to put teams together. Um, but we also know that, uh, it's not always possible to get all of the competence in, in one country or one site. So there's, you know, teams do collaborate across countries, but where we get together, um, is where we need to get together. You know, like if we have, uh, you know, a number of people working in different countries or different uh, locations where we need to do like, um, you know, quarter quarterly planning or in IKEA we use tertials and we plan on a four month cycle you know we get together we share lessons learned we you know we we demo what we built we get feedback on it we, we we network we plan together we do a lot of that brainstorming you know together right but we don't necessarily do it every week um but in the, in 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 the meantime i think uh, i personally think it's a you know it is encouraged for the manager and the and the prospective candidate to to discuss what's best for them, right? But with the understanding that by working together face to face, that's the most effective way of doing it. But it's not the only way of doing it. And so it's it's a uh, there's no one size fits all here uh, from from my perspective and 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 from a IKEA perspective. Although we do encourage uh, you know meeting our customers, obviously we meet them face to face. But and, and of course meeting our coworkers uh, is the best way to do that is face to face. And what do you think, Martin? I think uh, I agree with what you say. I think at, at Motatus, we're a smaller company, so, so we don't need the, the clear guidelines. But I think it's up to each manager and employee to figure out what works best for the employee. I think some of the tougher problem solving really benefits from being in the same room for it. But then in terms of like sustainability, carbon footprint, like traveling into the office, maybe people don't need to come in every day, but it, the people need to be in the same room when it makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I think that goes into being a sustainable employer as well, making sure that you have people that feel good. Everyone doesn't feel good by having to come to the office every day, but, but I think there are there are occasions when it really does make sense, like, like the quarterly or tertial planning, um, mm. th those type of occasions. Yeah. So that answers your question, Gemma. 
It does, it does. We have got another question that's popped up too. Sorry, I was just trying to pop it on. Um, so people are a key factor to maintain sustainability, both employees and consumers. What is your take on this? Maybe I can start. Um, absolutely. Um, I think it's uh, it's important that sustainability is um, you know, on the leadership of the company's radar. Um, I'm fortunate in that IKEA, you know, it's it's part of our uh, you know our forever values, you know, uh, being uh, caring. But it's also broken down into our strategies, our ten year horizon. Um, you know, we have a focus on accessibility, affordability, and sustainability. Um, it's also broken down into our strategies on a three-year horizon, uh, where we have a focus on 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 on, car on the carbon footprint as well as the people aspects of sustainability as well. Um, it is something that uh, our customers are interested because um, we coexist on the same planet. Uh, it's something our employees are interested in. Um, so it's it's seen as something we take seriously, and therefore our employees uh, you know want to work for companies that uh, take it seriously. I think the the big challenge for us is is like what we touched on earlier about um, the uh, the transparency. Uh, we need to, at the very least, you know, be engage our employees. Um, we we have a strong culture in IKEA. We, you know, we're very much a store company. You know, where even myself, I'm encouraged to to, to go on the shop floor a couple of days a year just to keep my sort of uh, uh, keep myself honest. Um, and when you walk around a store, if you see some rubbish. If you see some scrap, if you see some cardboard, if you see it, you own it, right? So there is that mindset. If you see some waste, you own it. You're responsible for it. You deal with it. You pick it up and you put it and you get rid and you put it where it's supposed to be, right? If you don't see your energy consumption, how can anyone own it, right? So I think that 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 that's where the opportunity lies. That if you if we engage our employees and 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 and, and, and are transparent and invi invisible in terms of what are we consuming, not just the physical stuff, but the stuff that's in the walls, it's invisible. I think that's gonna that that will drive uh, uh, a movement that will um, accelerate our, our you know the um, changes in behavior, or, or, so that we're engaging the employees to make the right decisions, turning lights off, you know. Starting dishwashers uh, when it's full, uh, starting ovens when it needs to be started, not two hours before the store opens. You know, these, these, these type of things. For potatoes, I would say same thing, but for, for uh, customers or consumers, putting data in their hands, making them understand the impacts of, of their consumption and, and really empower them to make good choices, I think is a key aspect both for potatoes and, and for consumers. And I think there's a bit of a fellow on part. Um, how about working overtime from one to five? How you agree? I like to know both opinions. Thank you. I this is uh, I think th this is a great question. I will base my answer on uh, how we work in Sweden. Um, <laughs> in Sweden, we uh, have a working week, which is 40 hours. To me, I don't care the people about the people I'm work I care very much about the people I'm working with, but I don't care if they work 20 hours this week because they have less on their agenda, but maybe have crunch time ahead of an important deadline next week and then we're work more hours then. I think it's important that my coworkers and colleagues are empowered to make decisions that suit them and their deliveries rather than working um, oh, working when it's not needed and then not being able to work as much when it's needed and i mean this i think then if you have you have to work 60 hours every week i mean either you're taking on too much work or you're not effective much uh, enough but then it's something you, sh you should bring up with with your manager so and i think it's not sustainable to work 60 hours every week or 80 or 100. yeah couldn't agree more. I don't know where. <laughs> I don't know how I can add more other than say that um, you know it, it's to be avoided. It's not sustainable, as you say, to do it. But occasionally, you know, a coworker uh, might discuss with me that, that they need to do a few extra hours. Is it okay? Um, but that's a dialogue that one should have continuously, right? So that it's not something that's happened. Uh, that that you know, I you know, I, I say okay fine and then we don't have a discussion for six months and i found out that they've been working 60 hours a week or whatever for for, for months no it, it is um 
and it's also different from the different type of work contract you have. So, for example, you know, it's uh, it's more highly regulated, probably. I think in the in the in the in the in the stores um, in within in working within IT and digital. You know, we, we do have to make sure that we man up, um, woman up, or, or staff up. Maybe that's a better word. Uh, sorry, uh, that's my own <laughs> bias showing itself. Yeah, we have to staff up to make sure that we can handle the service level, service levels, you know, twenty four seven or whatever. Um, so it should never be something that you burden on on individuals. It's it's something you have to factor in in terms of uh, the, the the cost of the, of providing that uh, service or digital solution. Um, but you, I think the in, back to the individual manager. You, there needs to be a continuous dialogue to, uh, so that. Um, the, the individual, the co-worker, uh, has a work-life balance. And um, that's a really tricky one. Um, <laughs> I, I have to, I actually have to go on a work environment, uh, re re refresh your training course soon. So I'm probably uh, going to have We'll to save that for a few weeks' time then. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Indeed. But Perfect. I have done well, before, so. <laughs> uh, well, just like that, we've been alive for an hour. Um, so, do you, any of you have any wrapping up thoughts, any last things that you want to get off your chest before we end? No? I think uh, it was really exciting to hear Connor's perspective on the importance of data, and I fully ag agree upon it. I really think it's about getting data on how we're having impacts and then being able to be make better decisions both as an employer as an employee and as a customer based on, on how we're impacting our carbon footprint and the sustainability of what we do so really interesting to hear your perspective connor yeah and and just uh, i mean i i've uh, i really uh, enjoyed the sort of the the the, the to and fro of the discussion and also uh uh, you know your perspective, especially on uh, on the food waste uh, side of things as well, um, and also you also talked about uh, you know the, in the in the fashion industry as well in the clothing industry, um, and I and just for following up on the the, the comment there about uh, overtime in terms of releases of the product, um, that that's also something I think that uh, where we need to be thinking about leveraging agile ways of working and continuous delivery. And, and not having these big releases that require a lot of extra effort and a lot of extra time and effort. So I think um, this is where I would say that it's to be avoided. And, that, and the, the problem you've got there or the challenge we've got there is that uh, why do you have such big releases that require such that require overtime? You should be breaking down your solution, your architecture and going down to uh, a microservice architecture with, uh, you know, API controlled uh, you know, into independent uh, solutions that can allow you to go into production hundreds of times a day potentially so the a release is you know no big deal so um, I think there's a, there's a there's a lot we can do in tech to to mitigate the impact on uh, individual co-workers working in IT um, and that there is a strong incentive to move towards more agile more DevOps more uh, microservice architecture so that we don't have those kind of situations happening long term Perfect. Well, that's a lovely ended thought. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to this conversation. I've learned so much. Um, I'm going to hopefully use a lot of it in my normal life. Um, so thank you so much. We're going to end the live stream here, but thank you for everyone for tuning in. And if you do want to listen again or share with your friends, this will also be on Spotify. So you'll be able to find it by looking at our Evolution Exchange Sweden channel. Thank you. Thank you.